Thanks for checking out this week's podcast from Center Street Church. We pray it blesses, encourages, and inspires you. Well, thank you for leading us in worship. And I know that um, we're into the new year almost a week already. Uh, But to those of you here at Central Campus, those of you who are joining us online, also those of you who are meeting at uh, one of our other campuses in Northwest Calgary and South Calgary, in Airdrie and also in Bridgeland, I just want to say that my prayer for all of you is that, that you would grow deeper in your walk with God this year by stepping into the faith-building adventures that he has for you. Our Northwest Campus uh, stepped out in faith to the new thing God has for them, moving into a new venue at the Bears Paw Lifestyle Center, uh, where for the first time in years, this group of people will be able to uh, worship together. And uh, they've been in two theaters, so they actually uh, are going to be able to worship together, which will be great. So bless all of you for making the adjustments there in Northwest Calgary, and for those of you who helped with the move. And... Uh, Also, uh, the many of you who signed up to the various teams who are going to be engaged in some major setup, which has been perhaps as one of the the negatives of this new venue. But uh, thank you for all that are going to be working and helping out that way. I also want to commend um, those of you who took the time to pray and then to invite someone, uh, in some cases to invite all kinds of people. Talked to one individual, invited a dozen people to our Christmas production or the Christmas Eve services uh, this year. Uh, Only eternity uh, will really reveal how many lives were impacted. Uh, But in our Christmas Eve services, 17 children committed their lives to Jesus Christ. That's wonderful. And 37 adults let us know by filling out a response card that they prayed for the first time to begin a relationship with Jesus. And, uh, and so, you know, a total of 54 people on Christmas Eve became part of God's forever family. I think that's worth celebrating. I was telling uh, one of the charter members, one of the founding members of our church, that almost as many people came to Christ on Christmas Eve as what started this church some 60 years ago. And uh, we thank God for that. He's on the move, church. And I just want to thank you again, as I have so often, for your faithful living, your faithful serving, and also for your faithful giving to God and to his church. May God bless you all. Okay, so I invite you to open your Bibles. And, uh, you know, maybe before I just say that, I just happened to look out my office window um, about uh, 20 minutes ago or whenever it was, and cars driving all over the place trying to find a place to park. And so I just want to again say that uh, we have eight services in this church. Eight. At five different locations. And so some of you may want to consider coming to one of the other services that meets at this location or one of our other campuses just to open up a little more space uh, for those that perhaps are newer, and if you're newer, I, it's one of the reasons I'm just mentioning this, um, because we uh, want you to be aware of that, and it um, uh, might be an option that you may want to consider and pray about. Um, so anyways, just thought I'd mention that. So, um, open your Bibles to the fourth chapter of Colossians as we continue our study through this wonderful book. The Apostle Paul starts out this particular chapter by challenging us to be devoted to prayer. God wants his kingdom to come. He wants his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And he has chosen to do it primarily through our obedience and through our prayers. Prayer changes things. It is powerful and it is effective. Prayer can change hearts. It can change circumstances, attitudes, and relationships. It can help us face daily hardships. It it can heal physical, emotional, spiritual problems. It can restore broken marriages, heal broken relationships, and meet financial needs. Prayer can do anything that God can do. 
And that is an important distinction to note because it isn't prayer that's powerful. It is God who is powerful, amen? amen? But he has chosen. But he has chosen to do his work and to release his power through us, through our prayers, and through our obedience to him. And so it is with that introduction, I want you to stand with me as, and join me in reading our scripture lesson for today. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you again for giving these words, inspiring Paul to write these words. And I pray that you would deepen our understanding and, Lord, that you would help us to know what it is that you're saying to us and what it is you want us to do about it. Soften our hearts, focus our minds, give us the courage to respond in whatever way you'd have us to. For I pray it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. So the other day I read this humorous story about a man who encountered some serious trouble while he was flying his small plane. He contacted the control tower and he said, pilot to tower, I'm 300 miles from the airport, I'm 600 feet above dense forest in mountainous terrain, and I'm out of fuel. Please advise. Over, the dispatcher responded and said, tower to pilot, repeat after me, our father who art in heaven. You know, for many of us, when we think of prayer, we think of emergency situations like this. When a family member or a close friend becomes critically ill. Or when we lose our job or our business tanks. For many people, that's the time they pray. And it is perfectly okay. It's right and good to pray during those times because God wants us to bring our needs and our burdens to him. However, notice here in verse 2, Paul challenges us to devote ourselves to prayer. To be devoted to something means it's, in, it's important to you. It's part of your daily life. When a person is devoted to something, it shows. It, it sort of oozes out of their pores. They care deeply about it. They talk about it. They give time to it. They're committed to it. It's part of their lives. In Ephesians chapter 6, 18, Paul writes this, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Now notice how often he uses the word all in this verse. Paul is saying praying isn't just a little add-on to our lives. Prayer is to be the center of our lives. Prayer is to be part of the rhythm of our lives, our daily routine, the way that eating and, and sleeping are. It isn't just a five-minute ritual each morning or before each meal. No, prayer is, to be, is being consciously aware that God is with us at all times and therefore interacting with him all through the day. You see, fundamentally, prayer is a growing friendship with God. It's communicating with God, talking to Him, but also listening to Him, primarily through the Scriptures. I mean, can you imagine sitting down with someone over a meal and not saying a word to each other? It would feel rather awkward, wouldn't it? I mean, you'd find yourself kind of saying, like, what's wrong with you? When you are near someone, especially for a period of time, it's just natural to interact with them, even if it's just saying, hi, my name is. Well, in the same way, if we believe that, if we believe Jesus' promise in, in Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, that he is with us always, 
If we believe that's true, then you would think we would want to communicate with him. I'm reminded of the story of the sailor whose ship was sinking, surrounded with sharks. And the water poured in, as the water poured in, he looked up to heaven and he said, Lord, I haven't bothered you for 15 years. If you save me from this, I promise I won't bother you again for another 15 years. <laughs> you see, often that's the mindset that people have in relation to prayer. Like you're doing God a favor when you don't bother him. Or you come to him for help only as an absolute last resort. Well, we've tried everything. I guess all that's left to do now is to pray. And yet God didn't create us to ignore us. He didn't create us so that we would ignore him. He created us to have a relationship with us. You know, this past week, my wife Gwen and I had the joy of taking care of some of our grandkids. And um, after spending my day off with them, um, and then a number of the evenings, didn't take long for me to remember the days when our boys were small. And how even though you love them dearly, the highlight of the day for us as parents was nap time. And then, bedtime. <laughs> those times you could decompress, those times you could rest, those times you had, you know, just time to think. It also reminded me why parents of small children tend to suffer irreparable brain damage over time. <laughs> I mean, when you have a bunch of kids trying to get your attention all at once, and you hear, mommy, 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 a hundred times a minute, and this goes on for hours. Something unplugs. <laughs> Something short circuits, just gets fried in your brain. And you enter into this fantasy land of your own making where you're walking through lush fields <laughs> or you're sitting on a beach taking in the sun, all the while being totally oblivious to kids who are still trying to get your attention. I mean, they can raise their voice, they can literally be poking you in the ribs for like five minutes before you suddenly tune in and realize that two of them really need to go to the bathroom and one already went. <laughs> because he couldn't hold it anymore. But my point is, the Bible teaches that God isn't like that. He doesn't need to decompress. He doesn't look forward to nap time or bedtime where we will stop pestering him and asking him a thousand questions an hour. He doesn't tune out. He doesn't tune us out. No, God loves it when we come to him. He delights in our prayers. Proverbs 15, 8 says, the prayer of the upright pleases him. Isaiah 62, verse 6, essentially says that God loves to be approached by his children. He invites us to keep coming to him, to keep asking him for whatever need we have. In fact, Revelation 5, verse 8 says, our prayers and our relationship with him is like the sweet smell of incense to him. In the same way that that most of us love the aroma of fresh bread coming from the kitchen. He's just crazy about us. In 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9 says, For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to Him. See, Christianity is not a religion of performance. It's not a religion or a system of, of rituals, a system of do's and don'ts. Christianity is all about the heart. 
And the passage I just quoted a moment ago says God is on a search. He literally is looking for a certain kind of heart. A heart that's totally devoted to him. So that he can strengthen, empower, direct, lead, guide, bless that individual. In short, God is looking for people who are committed to cultivating a friendship with him. And church, I believe the litmus test of where our heart is really at is our prayer life. Because prayer is all about a relationship with God. It's about listening to him, and it's about speaking to him. When we make prayer our top priority, when we refuse to neglect our relationship with God, we are declaring by our actions, you, O oh Lord, are the most important person in my life. When we give God our best time, even when pressures and urgent circumstances are screaming at us to devote our time elsewhere, we are declaring by our actions a settled conviction that it is not our efforts, it is not our giftedness, it is not our brilliance, but prayer that releases God's wisdom, direction, and power in our lives and the lives of other people. So what might being devoted to prayer look like practically? Well, first of all, it involves spending time alone with God each day. In Matthew 6, verse 6, Jesus said this, But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. This is where you go to a quiet place and you get to know God in a deeper, in a more intimate way by reading, reflecting, and meditating on God's Word. It's also a time you ask God to speak to you through the Scriptures. In fact, that's how you approach that time. You say, God, as I read this passage, would you speak to me through it? And as you read the scriptures, he may reveal a truth to you that you never saw before. He may remind you of a promise or he may encourage you in some way or give you wisdom or direction for your life. Or he may point out a bad attitude or a sin, or an idol in your life that you just need to confess and release. When you go into that room and close the door, this is your time to pour out your heart. So many times we seek out other people to pour out our heart. And we weigh our words because we're not sure we can totally trust them. And sometimes we only talk to people and we don't talk to God who is the most unbelievably trustworthy individual on the planet, in the universe. So pour out your heart to God. Share with Him whatever is on your heart as you would your closest and most trusted friend. Tell him things that you celebrate, your joys. Thank him for his goodness in your life. Share with him your heartbreak, your troubles, your fears, your insecurities, your worries, the unhealthy habits that you're struggling with. And let him know your longings. Let him know your desires. And ask him to change those longings or those desires if they aren't aligned with his best for you. Keep no secrets from him. Keep no hurts from him. Be an open book with him. Don't hold anything back. Because unlike anyone else, he is totally trustworthy. And he has your best interest at heart. Now, if you have trouble staying focused in that time, get up and walk around. 
pray out loud. This is why you might want to have a private area <laughs> where you can feel free to pray out loud. Or consider maybe writing out your prayers. These are just some of the main things that you may want to include in your time with God each day. You may do that in one time in the morning or do what I'm doing more recently, and that is I've actually broken it up into three times a day, kind of following the example of Daniel. Little time in the morning, stop midday, just to remind myself again that he's God and I'm not. Read some scripture and draw some nourishment from him and encouragement. And then again in the evenings before I go to bed. Furthermore, being devoted to prayer also involves communicating with God through the, throughout the day. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 challenges us to pray continually. This is having an ongoing dialogue with God in your mind and spirit all day. It means keeping the communication line open between you and God. When you witness an accident, even though you may not know the people involved, take it to the Lord in prayer. When you're struggling with finding a solution to a problem at work, take it to the Lord in prayer. When you're talking with someone and they share a health concern or some other major issue in their life, offer to pray with them right then and there. If you're driving and you're feeling just overwhelmed by the goodness of God, crank up worship music and go crazy singing out your praises to God. If a person suddenly comes to mind, don't assume it's a coincidence. Assume that God may have put that person on your mind and proceed to pray for them. If you find yourself stressed over meeting with someone, take that anxiety to the Lord before the meeting. Ask him to give you a calm, to show you why that anxiety even exists. You see, these are just a few examples of what it means to be devoted to prayer. What it means to have a living, growing friendship, relationship with Jesus that includes moments alone with him and then goes on all day. Now notice, secondly, Paul says we're to be watchful in prayer. We're to be devoted to prayer. We're to be watchful in prayer. To be watchful means to be alert. It means to be alert to the needs of other people and also our attitudes toward other people. You know, Jesus said that our enemy, the devil, has an agenda for humanity. And it is to steal and to kill and to destroy us. From the time that a person embraces Christ as their Savior, from the time that a person is baptized, all the powers of hell get directed at that individual to take them out of the action, to get them to back away from the decision that they've made to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And one of the things we always need to be watchful for is our attitude toward other people. And to ask ourselves, am I joining Satan in his cause by being envious of that person or competing with that person or slandering that person or throwing that person under the bus to somehow make ourselves look better? Am I bringing division to the small group I'm part of? Are there things I'm doing that's destructive to the kingdom of God? Am I being a mouthpiece of the enemy by judging others directly or behind the scenes, by discouraging others, by gossiping about others? Or am I joining our Lord in loving and encouraging others, supporting others with my prayers, wishing and praying for God's very best in their lives? Because you see, that's the heart of God. And when we're followers of the Lord, that needs to be our heart as well. Are we alert to other people's needs? When we hear someone share something that's heavy, do we just walk away or say, oh, I'll pray about that and then forget about it? Or do we take the time to perhaps write it down into our prayer journal and then pray about that daily or weekly? 
Being watchful in prayer means to be alert to the needs of others and our attitude toward others. Furthermore, to be watchful means to be alert to the things that hinder you from praying. James 4.2 says you do not have because you do not ask God. F.B. Meyer once said, the great tragedy of life is not unanswered prayer, but unoffered prayer. We need to be alert to the natural tendency within us to not pray. We need to be alert to our pride, where we are just simply too proud to say to a friend or to our spouse, you know, we should stop right now and pray about that. Being watchful in prayer is also being alert to the things that often distract us from spending time with the Lord in prayer. If I were to come home and say hi to my wife Gwen and then head downstairs and watch TV for the rest of the evening, and if I did that day after day after day, it wouldn't take a neurosurgeon to figure out that something is wrong with our marriage. In the same way, being alert in prayer is to ask ourselves, why is it that I consistently make time and have time to work out, to surf on the net, to watch TV, to play sports, to pursue other hobbies, but I consistently put off making time to grow in my relationship with the Lord. Furthermore, being watchful in prayer is to be alert to the tendency to give up praying. Some people give up praying about a certain situation because they feel their prayers just aren't making any difference. In Matthew 7, verse 7, Jesus said this, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. What I want to point out from that verse is that the verbs that are used in that sentence are in the present tense and therefore could be translated this way. Keep on asking. Keep on seeking. Keep on knocking. I have two brother-in-laws. And I prayed for both of them. I had them in my prayer journal. I prayed for both of them for 10 years. And I can still distinctly remember the day when I decided that I wasn't going to pray for them anymore. I found over the years, as, as time went by, every time I came to their name, my prayers became shorter and shorter, and I just became convinced they weren't making a difference. And they didn't seem to be changing. Nothing seemed to be happening. And one day I just said, I'm done just not praying for them anymore. Came to their name, just skipped right over them. Three months later, got a knock on my office door from my assistant, told me that one of my brother-in-laws had dri driven for three hours, was here to see me, came into my office, put his head on my desk, and began to weep uncontrollably. And by the time he left the office, he'd committed his life to Christ. Three months later, two o'clock in the morning, the phone rang. My other brother-in-law called and said that he had just committed his life to Christ. And I distinctly remember sensing the Lord say to me, don't you give up praying for others or for anything. You trust me. And you pray. You leave the outcome. You leave the timing to me. I'm doing things you don't see. I'm working ways you're not even aware of. Your responsibility is to pray. You leave the rest to me. Some of you may feel that you've lost your desire, your passion to pray about a situation like I did. Because you've prayed about everything you can think about praying for that person. And you recall the time early on 
You were passionately praying for that person. But as the years went on, you started losing that passion. You're sort of giving up. And you've maybe quit praying about that situation. Well, just remember, persisting in prayer does not mean necessarily praying long or long and passionate prayers every time you pray about a situation. In fact, I'm convinced this is one of the greatest reasons why we tend not to pray at all. It's because we have this mindset that, you know, unless our prayers are passionate, unless our prayers are long, and, you know, we're on the floor prostrate before God for three hours every time we pray, you know, our prayers don't make any difference. And so our tendency is not to pray at all. Folks, God wants us just to be real and to be genuine in our praying, which means at times we may be feel, feel led to pray 15 minutes for a certain situation and another time, 15 seconds. And that's okay. You see, persistent prayer does not mean a long prayer necessarily. It means not giving up on praying. Furthermore, being watchful in prayer means to be alert. Be alert to the doubt and the unbelief that's in our lives. For example, as Christians, we know the Bible clearly teaches that we live in two realms. The natural earthly realm and the spiritual heavenly realm. We know that in the spiritual realm, we have an enemy who is out to steal our joy, to kill our hope, and to destroy our very lives. We know that there are powers and principalities in the spirit realm that are messing with members of our family. Now, please understand, I'm not saying there's a demon under every rock. If your engine blows up on your way to church, don't immediately immediately conclude that a demon did it in order to prevent you from coming to church. Now, we know that could very well be the case. But more likely, it's because you failed to change your oil for the last five years. <laughs> In other words, don't play the demon card every time something goes wrong, especially when you know what went wrong is your fault. It's your doing. But here's my point. We need to be alert to the fact that sometimes we don't pray for our children and for God's protection over our children because we really don't believe that there are demonic forces after our children or our loved ones because if we really did, we'd shut off the television more, we'd walk away from our computer more and pray more for their protection. I mean, think about it. If your son or daughter... We're on the front lines in Syria or Iraq right now. You would be on your knees praying your heart out for their protection. You'd be asking everyone that you know to pray for your son or daughter. But let me ask you, why don't we pray with the same earnestness for God to protect our loved ones, our spouse, our good friend, our children, in the same way? Could it be because we don't believe the warfare that's going on in the spirit world isn't as real and as potentially destructive to us and to our loved ones as what's going on in the natural world? Paul writes, be alert to the tendency in your life that downplays the spirit realm and Satan's agenda and keeps you from putting on the full armor of God and for praying for God's protection over your life and your loved ones. And then finally, being watchful in prayer is to be alert to any tendency in your life to not pray about unimportant or small things. A couple of months ago, someone in our community group invited 
a young woman to come to our community group. Life had not treated her very well. And um, she just really can come to the conclusion that God wasn't for her. So when she came into our home, immediately we noticed that, I noticed that she was limping really badly. She had sprained her ankle terribly uh, earlier that day. And, and her ankle was swollen. And all evening, I could tell, you know, she was wincing with pain every time she moved. Well, at the end of the evening, as she was making her way up the stairs from our basement, one step at a time, groaning with each step as she went, I sensed the Lord prompting me to offer to pray for her. I was tired. And I thought to myself, you know, it, it, it's only a sprained ankle. You know, people sprain their ankles every day. You know, it'll get better over time. But I couldn't shake God's prompting. And so I bounded up the stairs after her and asked her if we could pray for her. And she said, well, you know, you, you just need to know. I don't believe in God. I don't believe in the Bible. Um, and I said, that's okay. And she says, oh, well, okay, go ahead. So we call, I called some people around. We prayed for her. And after we did, I watched her limp out the door. The next morning, she woke up. And... Um, the swelling was all gone. She couldn't quite believe that, but then she started walking around and she had absolutely no pain. And so she went to her roommate and says, I don't understand this. Like, this is just flat out weird. Like, I didn't think this would happen. What is this all about? And proceeded to reach out to um, the couple that brought her. And ultimately, she came to faith in Christ that day. But you see, I, I came that close to passing it off and saying, you know, her, her ankle will get better eventually. But you see, God had a bigger purpose in mind. We rarely know that what the, what the greater purposes of God why he heals sometimes and why he doesn't heal at other times. I mean, I prayed for all kinds of people and there was no evidence of healing. But you see, our calling is simply to be obedient and to pray when he asks us to and to trust him with the rest, believing he has our best interests at heart in all things and that his purposes are real. And we'll make a difference through our prayers and through our steps of obedience. Paul says, be watchful, alert to the thoughts, the feelings, the attitudes that keep you from praying. And then finally, Paul writes, be thankful in prayer. All through Colossians and the scriptures, we're reminded to be thankful and to give thanks to God. Here in Colossians 3.15, Paul writes, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts and be thankful. In verse 16, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Verse 17, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, rejoice always, Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Part of praying continually, part of communication with God that just blesses him so is when all through the day we give thanks for who he is what he has done and what he is doing in our lives and the lives of people around us. Being thankful in prayer is reminding ourselves of 
the greatness of God. It's one of the reasons we worship, to remind ourselves of the character of God, who he is, that our majestic God who created the universe, who raised Jesus Christ from the grave is more than able to accomplish what concerns me today. Being thankful in prayer is reminding ourselves of the goodness of God, that he longs to hear my voice and my prayer requests, that he has my best interests at heart, and that in all things, his answer to my request will be for my ultimate good and for his ultimate glory. But most importantly, being thankful in prayer means I never forget. I never forget what Jesus did for me. Back in chapter 1, verse 12, Paul spells out what God the Father did for us through, his, through God the Son. This is what it says. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son He loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Let me ask you, if you end up in heaven one day, how do you think you will have gotten there? Ask that question of people in our culture. Their answer will be something like, well, I'm going to be in heaven because I tried to be a really good person. I tried to really do good things. You know, someone once said, if you see a turtle on top of a fence post, you know someone put him there. Well, in the same way, if you see me in heaven one day, it won't be because I earned my way there or crawled my way there through good deeds or because I lived a more righteous life than someone else. No, I'm going to be in heaven because someone put me there. Because someone rescued me by paying the price for my redemption, qualifying me to not only enter heaven when I die, but to be a friend of God. And that someone is Jesus Christ. As many of you know, there's been a civil war raging off and on in the nation of Sudan on the African continent since 1955 that has taken literally millions of lives and caused millions more to leave the country as refugees. A number of years ago, one of the warring factions came up with a hideous strategy in which they would attack a village in the middle of the night and they would kill every man that they could find. And then they would drag the women and the children off with them into a kind of slavery. And they would do unmentionable things to them, destroying their souls. But then some fired up Christ followers in Europe and North America, when they heard about this, and they said, at the risk of our own lives, we are going to meet with this warring faction. And when they met with them, they said, our intention is not to get involved in your civil war, but would you allow us to buy these women and children from you? And the leaders of that warring tribe said, sure. And do you know what price they attached to these women and children? $33 a person. And so the Christians went back to their churches and they raised money day and night. And they took the money they collected 
And they said, we have enough money here to buy 200 of these women and children. Here it is. And 200 women and children were set free that day because these Christians had paid the price to redeem them. Can you imagine what those women and children must have felt when someone they didn't even know bought their freedom and relieved them from the horrible abuse that they were suffering? And Paul is saying to you and to me, you need to understand in the spirit realm, Jesus paid the price for your redemption and it was a whole lot more than $33. You were bought at the ultimate price in which the God of the universe, out of love for us, the second person of the Holy Trinity, left his heavenly home and came to our place, taking upon himself the form of a man. And then ultimately dying to pay the price that was on our head for the sins we'd committed so that we might be redeemed forever. Rescued from the dominion of darkness. Brought into the kingdom of light and into a relationship with our Heavenly Father. And he did all of this not only so that one day we will live forever with him in glory, but also so that we could be a friend of God. Would you bow your head, close your eyes, just for a few moments. As we enter into another year, prepare our hearts to partake of the Lord's Supper together. I think this would be a good time to pause for a few moments, not only to remember and to give thanks for the high price that Jesus paid for our redemption, but also to reflect on our prayer life and what our prayer life is saying about how close our relationship is with God. Imagine if all of us who are part of Center Street Church were to devote ourselves to prayer in the way that we've talked about. We're, we're to cultivate a relationship with Jesus, walking with Him, talking with Him, listening to Him each and every day, and doing what He called us to do. So I think we just need to start right now and to ask ourselves, Lord, what are you saying to me? And Lord, what do you want me to do about it? Just take a moment right now to prepare your heart for our time around the Lord's table and to wrestle with that question. Our Heavenly Father, we praise you today because you are all-powerful, all-knowing, everywhere present. We thank you for your faithfulness, for your mercy and grace, for saving us from our sins, for loving us despite our failures and our selfishness. Lord, we long to be in close relationship with you, and so we ask that you would forgive us 
for those times we've gone our way rather than your way. Those times we've not involved you in our day. Those times we've just taken you and your grace for granted. Those times we've taken your presence for granted. Cleanse us of sin and renew us by your Holy Spirit, I pray, that we may love you and magnify your holy name. I ask, Lord, that you would bless and sanctify with your word and spirit these gifts of bread and the fruit of the vine, that we receiving them, Lord, may be partakers of the divine nature through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Imagine if all of us going forward were to be devoted to prayer in the way we've talked about. Wow. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his precious peace. In the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks for listening. We hope this message has impacted you. We'd like to challenge you to take it one step further and get connected. For any questions or prayer, please visit our website at cschurch.ca. You can also like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter.